The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thank you to all of our county officials that are joining us here today uh, for an important webinar, uh, which the New York State Association of Counties is presenting. Uh, the name of this webinar is Understanding State Law Enforcement Reforms and What Does uh, 50A of the Civil Rights Law Repeal Mean for Your County Government? My name is Stephen Aquario. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Counties, and I'd like to thank you uh, for taking time from uh, what is a, a constant busy day in government administration, whether you're from Long Island, the North Country, Hudson Valley, Capital District, Southern Tier, Mohawk Valley, uh, Central New York, Western New York, uh, all across the state, we have a broad representation of county officials from all across the state that are joining us today for this important webinar. I want to recognize and thank our president, uh, the Honorable Jack Marin, uh, who is uh, listening uh, on the call today, the webinar. Uh, Jack is the supervisor of the town of Victor in Ontario County and also serves as the president of the New York State Association of Counties and the chair of the Ontario County Board of Supervisors. He's a very thoughtful individual who's contributed an awful lot towards the association's work and uh, provided incredible leadership during these challenging times that are facing our counties. Uh, next, I want to acknowledge the sponsor that is making today's webinar possible. Uh, the sponsor is the New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal, a property and casualty insurance uh, reciprocal, public reciprocal, uh, to more than 30 New York counties and 900 local governments in the state of New York. Jack Marin, the NYSEC president, is also a member of the Board of Governors uh, at the New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal, or NYMIR. NYMIR was created in 1993 by the Association of Counties, the Conference of Mayors, and the Association of Towns uh, to provide insurance for municipalities uh, during uh, a period of time where cycles and fiscal uncertainties and traditional insurance would not provide insurance. We're very pleased to have the sponsorship of NYMIR. NYMIR is governed by local government leaders, such as Jack Marin, for local governments. And it has the most comprehensive coverage and risk management programs available for New York's local governments. I'd like to also thank ISAC Deputy Director Mark, Mark Levine for his work and Alexandra Lamont of the NYSEC staff for her work in participating with NYMIR. Uh, thank you very much to NYMIR. So uh, as we get underway here, uh, questions uh, can be submitted on your dashboard that you have uh, in front of you at your computer screen. Please submit questions that you may have by typing in those questions on the dashboard under the questions tab. We'll try to hit those questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, today's session should take about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour will be the maximum amount of time that we have uh, for today's uh, webinar. Our, our featured speaker is Marty Mack. Uh, Marty uh, is an attorney uh, with Mack & Walsh, a law firm providing local governments with ethics training and ethics code review, as well as FOIL training. Uh, however, this is not a FOIL workshop. Uh, this is a workshop uh, or webinar to explain the recent changes on the repeal of the Civil Rights Law 50A and discuss new additions uh, to the Public Officers Law, Article 6, the Freedom of in Information Law. Uh, Marty is an attorney. He served in local and state government for several decades. Uh, yes, decades. Uh, and I'm proud to know him over those decades. He served as the mayor of Cortland County, New York, one of us as the Cortland County attorney and an assistant assistant district attorney on the state level. He served as the executive deputy attorney general for attorneys General Spitzer, Schneiderman, and Barbara Underwood. Uh, additionally, he served in the executive chamber as a member of the senior staff for governors Spitzer and Patterson, and I used to give him proudly a hard time. 
when he was in those roles uh, for those governors. Uh, Chris Walsh uh, is also an attorney and has served in state government as well uh, for Governor Spitzer, Patterson, and Andrew Cuomo, uh, and as an assistant counsel for Governor Mario Cuomo, uh, that is a member of the law firm of Mack and Walsh. However, it is just Marty Mack that is presenting today. Uh, uh, so uh, before I get into it with uh, attorney uh, Marty Mack, we're talking, of course, about a new statute that was passed by the New York State Legislature on June 9th. Effective uh, June 12th, the New York Civil Rights Law 50A is repealed. Uh, this statute uh, largely prohibited the disclosure of police power employees' personnel records. And prior to this repeal, 50A uh, prevented the disclosure of, of these records without either an express written uh, consent of a police officer or a court. Uh, it, it also applied uh, to corrections and firefighters and probation officers. Uh, the precedent included all personnel records used to evaluate the performance towards continued employment or promotion. Uh, and Marty Mack will get into uh, what that statute was because it's important to have a foundation of what the civil rights law was, how it was interpreted by the Court of Appeals as late as 20. Uh, 18, the New York Civil Liberties Union versus the NYPD Court of Appeals, 32 NY 3rd 556, had interpreted this statute. But the law uh, that we currently have in front of us firmly places police disciplinary records within the purview of the public officer's law, sections 84 through 90, and note that this new law amended the section, which is partially why we wanted to have this webinar today, it amended uh, the public officer's law to require or allow for the redaction of certain information prior to disclosure. So uh, this session today, this webinar, this presentation by Marty Mack will talk a bit about uh, what we knew to be about the formal, former civil rights law, 50A, and what we now understand the new law to be. So with that said, uh, I'll turn it over to Marty Mack. And again, I encourage all of you to submit your questions. We're also going to post on the website uh, at the this afternoon a checklist, a FOIL checklist, uh, which will you could use back in your community uh, to assist you as you were evaluating what should be redacted and what should be provided upon uh, public uh, disclosure. So Attorney Marty Mack. The floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's always been a pleasure working with you, even during some of the tough times when I was in the executive chamber. And also, uh, good morning to Jack Marin, who my daughter's from Ontario County, so uh, she's one of your constituents out that way. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I appreciate your, your being online this morning, and uh, I hope you're well and staying healthy. I know this is a tough time for county governments, but uh, I know you're all doing a good job as well. So let's start. Uh, the 50A story begins in 1973, actually. Richard Nixon was president and Nelson Rockefeller was governor of New York. Washington was focused on Watergate and Rockefeller drug laws were being passed in New York State and putting people away for serious time. Uh, the minimum penalty for selling two ounces of pot under the new laws was 15 years. It all kind of went up from there. And under those conditions, in New York City, and this is before 50A, before FOIL, a Mr. Sumter was arrested on drug charges. His lawyers knew they were in a war trying to beat a lengthy sentence. In preparation for the trial, Mr. Sumter's lawyers sent a subpoena to the NYPD requesting the disciplinary misconduct records for the two arresting officers who were expected to testify at the trial. Now, the NYPD then made a motion to quash the subpoena. They said this has never been done before, and the city charter prohibited it. Well, Sumter wanted the records to assist his case when the time came to cross-examine the two officers at trial. If the records evidenced misconduct, Sumter's lawyers would use that information to impeach the honesty and credibility of the officers. And of course, cross-examinations of one accusers is a fundamental right. And impeaching a witness and showing past bad acts as it, it can be an important part, a necessary part of cross-examination. 
the cross-examination would be subject to the control of the judge, of course, but at least they would have the records to make an effort. Now, what happened was the court denied the NYPD's efforts to quash the subpoena and allowed Mr. Sumter and his attorneys to have those records. And this seriously alarmed the NYPD, the police, and the police generally. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, as you know, uh, the Civil Rights Law 50A, which was passed in 1976, was uh, recently repealed. You know, and that has caused concern amongst many. But uh, today we'll look at that repeal and the changes to the FOIA law and show the differences in how law enforcement misconduct and disciplinary records are now accessed. Now, in that context, it's also important to remind oneself of the general principles of FOIA, which will now govern the release of police disciplinary records. But first, let's take a quick look at the 50A. As I said earlier, police were alarmed by the court's decision uh, to release their misconduct records to a defendant you know, in a criminal case. You know, acting on that alarm, the police lobbied Albany and the legislature, and three years later, in 1976, they enacted uh, you know, criminal procedure law or civil uh, rights law, Section 58. Now, remember at that time, there was a FOIA law passed in 74, but it was minimal, and it was, quick, it was repealed in 1977, and the law you have now, the foundation of that was the 1977 Act. So the Act of 50A, when 50A was enacted, it was really uh, an effort to control the ground on how prisoner uh, or how law enforcement correction officer records would be released. Now, 50A, as I'm sure you all know, pertains to police officers, firefighters, paramedics, correction officers, and probation officers. Now, if you look at the slide, go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I think I'm, uh, we should need to go back to one slide. Go back two slides here. Go back right there, right there. So what did the Civil Rights Law 58 do? As it permitted law enforcement officers to refuse disclosure of personnel records used to evaluate performance toward continued employment or promotion. Now that's kind of oblique language, but what it's come to be known as meaning is records relating to misconduct and discipline. And as the language shows, uh, the law enforcement officer in that large group of who's a law enforcement officer, they could refuse disclosure. So it was up to the individual to decide whether they would disclose or not. Now, without an officer's uh, permission, uh, the records would not be released. One could go to court, but when one went to court, it would need to be relevant to the ongoing proceeding. That means they would be in a civil action or a criminal action and then would make a request for those records. Now, when I was at the Attorney General's office uh, and I managed all the offices and all the cases around the state, uh, there would frequently be a request for these records, especially in uh, correction officer cases, when there was a lawsuit for damages or excessive force. And what would happen in that process, the records would be turned over to the, the judge, the judge would decide whether they are relevant or not. And more often than not, he denied their use, deeming that they weren't relevant. Now, the purpose, of course, for 50A, uh, which was adopted in 76, was to prevent criminal defense attorneys from using such records in cross-examination of police witnesses during criminal prosecution. Because when it was enacted, they were all thinking back to the Sumter case and others like it and wanted to avoid their use for those purposes. Now, the effect of it has been you know, that this, according to the Committee on Open Government, which was cited by the legislature recently when they repealed 50A, they said this narrow exemption has been expanded in the courts to allow police departments to withhold from the public virtually any record that contains any information that could conceivably be used to evaluate the performance of a police officer. Please, the next slide. Now, uh, the uh, uh, Eric Gardner case, which you all recall back in 2014, sparked discussion of repealing 58. 
And in fact, the, uh, in 2019, the New York City Police Commissioner, uh, who led a panel looking at 50A, proposed some changes. They suggested at the time that 50A re be repealed to the extent that it would, lo would allow the release of records uh, relating to misconduct and discipline when there was a showing of significant public interest. So that had been on the table and in discussion over the past year. But of course, uh, events in April and May changed everything in Albany. And there was a desire to entirely repeal 50A. And their justification for that is, as is noted on the slide, that the 50A defeated Boyle's goal of accountability and transparency. 50A became a legal shield that prohibits disclosure even when it is known that misconduct has occurred. And remember, 50A was passed before the FOIL we have now was enacted. FOIL already provides all public employees, including those protected under 50A, the protections necessary to guard against unwarranted invasions of privacy and from disclosures that could jeopardize their security or safety. And as you know, when 50A was being repealed in Albany, there was a great deal of consternation expressed by law enforcement that it would expose them uh, and put them at risk because of perhaps there would be access to personal information. But I think FOIL covers a lot of that, and there were already covered a, a lot of that, and there were changes in FOIL to try to accommodate that more so. And the other argument, the final argument, was that courts already have the ability to protect against improper cross-examination and determine if police records are admissible in trial without the denial of public access to information regarding police activity created by 50A. So 50A, of course, had a broad reach. It didn't reach just those who sought access for court cases, but reached the general public when there were no court cases. But whatever the justification for the repeal of 50A, it is a dramatic change for law enforcement. And 50A has provided protection afforded to no other public employees, and that is going to be a change. Next slide, please. Now, the repeal of 50A creates an entirely new environment for matters involving access to law enforcement disciplinary records. That environment is shaped by FOIL Article 6. And when repealing 50A, the legislature added amendments to FOIL to address law enforcement disciplinary records. But first, what is the FOIL environment for those seeking access to records? This is a re bit of a refresher on the overview, but it's important to remember that FOIL is based on a presumption of disclosure to ensure transparency. Certainly 50A did not carry with it a presumption of disclosure. One had to apply to court, one had to show its relevancy, and one had to convince a judge that it be released. And that was only in a proceeding. Otherwise, uh, access was blocked unless the law enforcement officer gave permission. Now, under FOIL, it will be released if requested unless there is an exception. The records must be disclosed. So that's an entirely different landscape and will be measured by different tools. Next slide, please. And also remember there are two general themes in creating exceptions to FOIL. Uh, exceptions are based on really two questions. Would an individual be harmed if the records relate to an individual? Or would disclosure hamper effective functioning of government? So those are the two questions really to be asking yourself whenever you receive any FOIL request. Is release gonna harm an individual and how? And is that harm uh, relate to an exception so you don't have to dis disclose? Or would the disclosure hamper effective functioning of government? And if so, how? And is there an exception that allows you not to disclose at the time? So when looking at FOIL exceptions, ask yourself those two questions. Next slide, please. The other key factors in FOIL that you should recall when looking at 50, what were 50A related questions or any case, is to remember that embarrassment is not a factor. 
embarrassment is not harm. You know, I in, was in government as a mayor and a county attorney, and I know, and at the state level, and I know things are done that are embarrassed and one would rather not have out there in the public, but uh, that's a fact of life. And the fact that somebody's going to be embarrassed by it, perhaps even shamed by it, is, is, is not harm. And also, the timing of the request is important because disclosure may be prohibited today or permitted today because there's an exception to FOIL, but that exception could change in three months. You know, you're not going to release information relating to bids today because bids are still out and being reviewed, but once those bids are closed and you have a lowest responsible bidder, then there may be no exception to release the information surrounding the bids. So you always have to consider the timing of the request and whether that provides you with an exception. It may one day and not another. And the other critical point to always recognize, especially when it comes to these what were once 50A documents, the discretion to disclose is a factor when a FOIL exception to disclosure applies meaning there is always authority to disclose unless disclosure is prohibited by state or federal law. So when you're looking for an exception, and more often than not, that's the desire, unless it's prohibited by state or federal law, you're free to release that information using your discretion. Doesn't mean there might not be consequences for doing that, but you're free to release that information. And it's the exception of state and federal law does not permit a local law to prohibit the disclosure of certain information. So you can't do on the local level in making something confidential uh, that isn't prohibited by state or federal law. Next slide, please. So all these definitions that are on this slide that you're looking at now apply specifically to the individuals and records uh, previously governed by 50A. So these four categories of, uh, of definitions uh, really almost double the number of definitions provided at the beginning of FOIL. But I think the legislature thought it was different, was, Im was important because it was different, to single out uh, a request for access to these law enforcement disciplinary records because for so long access had been denied and there was concern what access would now permit access to. So let's go through those definitions. Next slide, please. So let's look at uh, these. This is the first of the four definitions. Uh, law enforcement disciplinary records is any record created in furtherance of a law enforcement disciplinary proceeding included but not limited to you know, the complaints, allegations, and charges against an employee. And note, it says complaints the name of the employee complained of or charged, the transcript of any disciplinary trial or hearing, including exhibits introduced at the trial or hearing, and the disposition of any disciplinary proceeding. And finally, the final written opinion or memorandum supporting the disposition and discipline imposed, including the agency's complete factual findings and its analysis of the conduct and discipline imposed. So, you know, 50A didn't use the term disciplinary records. They used that general term we referenced before, and it was interpreted to mean that. But that's what it's come to mean. And FOIL now uses that word more clearly and adds a much greater clarity to what a law enforcement disciplinary record is. Next slide, please. Now, the second definition is a law enforcement disciplinary proceeding. And that's quite simply the commencement of any investigation and any subsequent hearing or disciplinary actions conducted by a law enforcement agency. The importance there is the word commencement of any investigation. So you have the complaint and you start looking at it, that's a proceeding. Uh, it may never result in a hearing even, but the commencement of the investigation is the proceeding. So it includes here both process and actions. Next slide, please. Now, the third definition, also, there's an error on this, at least on mine, maybe 86, it should be 86A and not 86.7, if yours shows 86.7. Uh, this is the third new definition, and it's what's a law enforcement agency. And this, you know, with great clarity, uh, basically identifies 
what had come to be included in 50A, a police agency or department of the state or any political subdivision thereof. And then it goes on to include, you know, the police officers, the sheriff's department, Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, local Department of Corrections and Probation Department, a fire department, or force of individuals employed as firefighters or firefighter paramedics. So all of those who are fall within these categories are part of a law enforcement agency. And so that part of FOIL, which specifically addresses law enforcement agencies, will be governed by those provisions. Those who fall outside of those categories will not be uh, covered by the new FOIL provisions. Next slide, please. Now, the fourth and final new definition is that of a technical infraction. Now, this is interesting because it's kind of a, a new concept. But the idea, I believe, was when uh, 50A was repealed is to create some uh, limitations on what there is access to involving discipline and misconduct. Because as you know, you know, there can be very minor infractions. Perhaps the uniform is gray pants and somebody wore blue pants and they got a write up for that. Well, that's a very minor uh, fraction. And so the new statute created uh, the definition of technical infraction. So as you'll see later, there's an option to redact that information. But looking at the rule, it's a minor rule violation by a person employed by a law enforcement agency as defined in this section as a police officer, peace officer, firefighter, et cetera, and do not involve interactions with men or members of the public. So for example, you know, wearing black pants rather than gray pants or vice versa, that doesn't really involve, the issue doesn't, the requirement doesn't involve interactions with the public and are not a public concern and are not otherwise connected to such person's investigative enforcement, training, supervision, or reporting responsibilities. Now, I expect over time, the meaning of this uh, language will be litigated because as you'll see in a moment, it allows uh, one to redact a technical infraction from the records. So one can probably expect uh, some uh, litigation over the years as to what uh, what this terms mean. But it should you know, minimize any claim that the FOIA requests and access to the records are just being used to harass somebody. Next slide, please. Uh, the new provisions uh, in uh, FOIA also have uh, a provision relating to redaction, both mandatory and optional. And these, of course, relate to the definitions we just looked at. But the important new section is 874A, which says a law enforcement agency responding to a request for law enforcement disciplinary records shall redact any portion of such record containing the information specified in subdivision 2B of section 89 of this article. We'll go through that in a minute. But it's important then that if you receive a FOIL and it relates to law enforcement disciplinary action information that you remember that you're required to redact certain information. And again, we'll look at that in a moment. And also uh, uh, a law enforcement agency responding to requests for law enforcement disciplinary records may redact any portion of such record containing the information specified in subdivision 2C. And we'll look at that in a minute. So these are two new categories in the file FOIL law that relate to a uh, request uh, for access to law enforcement uh, disciplinary action information. So you have to remember to look at these sections when you get that in a request for that information. So the next slide, please. So this is the language referenced above specifying what must be redacted when redacting law enforcement disciplinary records. The Freedom of Information Law, Article 6, when redaction required, Section 89 uh, 2B, and there's uh, five of these redaction requirements. For records that constitute law enforcement disciplinary records, a law enforcement agency shall redact the following information. 
items involving medical records of a person employed by law enforcement agency as a police officer, peace officer, or firefighter, or firefighter paramedic, not including records obtained during the course of an agency's investigation of such person misconduct that are relevant to the disposition of such investigation. For example, we would frequently have lawsuits against the state in the court of claim where there was a fight between, say, a correction officer uh, and an inmate. And injuries would occur, both uh, with the inmate and with the correction officer. It's a dangerous job. Those injuries could at times become relevant to the investigation because of the claims of what happened. So one has to assess whether or not these records relate to uh, the investigation and whether they are relevant or not. So it doesn't, doesn't uh, prohibit or require redaction of all medical records, uh, only those that are not relevant. Section 89.2b, B. the home addresses, the personal telephone cell numbers, the email addresses of a person employed by a law enforcement agency as a police officer, et cetera, uh, of a family member of such person, a complainant, or any other person named in a law enforcement disciplinary record, except where required by civil service law. This shall not prohibit other provisions of law regarding work-related, publicly available information, such as title, salary, and dates of employment. So this is important, though, because you know there was fear that when the legislature was looking to repeal 50A, that it might somehow lead to those in the public getting homes addresses or other personal information, which, of course, would put law enforcement officer safety and security at risk. But this specifically requires redaction of that information. Next slide, please. The, the final two. Uh, occurrences when redaction is required is with social security numbers, of course, and also disclosure of the use of an employee assistance program, mental health service, or substance abuse service by a person employed by a law enforcement agency as a police officer, peace officer, et cetera. Now, unless such use is mandated by a law enforcement disciplinary proceeding that may otherwise be disclosed pursuant to this article. So this is all, again, an attempt to be responsible to, uh, to law enforcement concerns about the release of personal information. Uh, please go to the next slide, please. So the new amendments to FOIL also made redaction optional for minor infractions identified in the law enforcement disciplinary records. Uh, 89.2c states, that for records that constitute law enforcement disciplinary records, a law enforcement agency may redact records pertaining to technical infractions as defined. And we saw the definition of that earlier. So again, when you're looking at these records, some of the information in the disciplinary record may be redacted because it's mandatory. Other information, if it's very minor and meets the definition of technical, you can redact it. It's, it's your option. So uh, the choice will be yours to make. But what it means is you have to look very closely at the record so that you can glean what's required, what's optional, and what doesn't you know, fall under either category. So it's going to take some time and certainly is moving into this new world of having such information available to be foiled, you're going to need to be special careful. Remember, it's important to remember that when you provide a response to FOIL, it needs to be in good faith. You need to be able to articulate a reason for the exception. The burden is on you. So it's important that you play the game fairly, but you certainly have a right to articulate a rationale. And as I mentioned before, I think the courts over time will be interpreting the meaning of some of this uh, language. But this is your path to, uh, to, fo uh, to FOIL now when these requests come in. Now, what I want to do now is go through a hypothetical that I'll read to you uh, that relates to a FOIL request for what would have been 50A information. Uh, now, uh, I sent, uh, and you're all going to receive, you haven't received it yet. I sent you all a checklist to use. Uh, it's in. Go to the next. No, go to the next slide, please. Uh, 
I sent you, this is a, ch a checklist, but it's not in very friendly form. And it, there's three pages to this checklist. What you're gonna be sent or it's gonna be posted for you to access is a FOIL checklist, like a pilot's checklist that you can use for your own purposes and you can use uh, in your agency uh, if, you, if you find it helpful. So that when you receive a FOIL request and uh, as you'll see how it works as we go through it, it can help guide you without missing important points. Uh, I've been using this checklist in one form or for another for the last 20 years, and I've uh, found it very helpful. Uh, I, I changed it to include uh, the new provisions of FOIL added by, uh, you know, when they repealed 50A. So let me give you a quick hypo, and then we'll walk through this checklist. Just to, again, get a general reminder of how you should address a FOIL issue, but it'll be specific to a request that might otherwise have fallen under 58. So here's a quick hypo, and I've, this is a quest I've seen many times over the year. So, uh, and this will help kind of show you how to use the thing. Uh, a county correction officer uh, and an inmate have a scuffle at the county jail. The inmate loses a tooth, and there is a dispute over what happened, nothing unusual. The inmate alleges excessive force. Now the inmate decides he's gonna foil the correction officer's personnel file and request all records relating to misconduct and discipline. So a very simple scenario. Correction officer, inmate, fight, scuffle, he's upset, he foils the records for misconduct and discipline, now knowing he can do so. So. Let's go through the checklist. Now, I, as I said, this checklist was used before 50A, and I'm gonna use the checklist now after 50A, but with some changes in the checklist because of the new FOIL law. So the way uh, I always use this at the Attorney General's office is that those on the front line who, in a sense, have the immediate access to uh, the FOIL information would be sent the checklist, and uh, they would go through the checklist, and at the end of the checklist, as you'll see on the user-friendly copy that you'll have access to, it is signed and dated by the person who's doing the initial review. And then this checklist would go up the line uh, and be reviewed uh, by uh, perhaps the department head or the division head. I was the division head for all the regional offices. And then would go to our FOIL officer. So the person who knows most about the records is making the first judgment call, but, but there would be a checklist to take a look at that, and then everybody would refer back to the checklist and ask questions about it or see if there were any concerns, or the original person could express concerns. So here's what it is. It could start out, so we have our scenario with the inmate making the request. The documents requested are attached. Well, you know, you have five days to initially respond, even just to say that we need more time. Uh, if by chance the FOIL officer or the person looking at FOIL just attached the records, well, they're attached and they're going to the FOIL record with them attached. But he should keep checking the boxes if that's what he does. This county department agency does not possess any responsive documents. Well, if they have them, they have them. If they don't, they don't. But if you don't, check the box. Because remember, these are records, not information. You may know it in your head, but if it's not in a record, it's not FOILable. Or you can check that the description is insufficient for purposes of locating and identifying documents sought. And you see, if you've seen FOIL requests, you know how inarticulate they can be, and you can be lost at what they're requesting. And there are many cases out there, you know, supporting uh, a government's right to say that it just the description is insufficient. Now there are decisions going the other way, but you you can just simply state that and in good faith if it's reasonable and, uh, and advise the requestee of, uh, of that fact. The next category is that documents are exempt from disclosure because they are subject to attorney-client privilege. Now, under the civil procedure law, this can be important and should be on the checklist. Even though it isn't part of FOIL, it is indirectly because it's the part where it's otherwise prohibited by state or federal law because you can uh, refuse to disclose something if they are attorney-client uh, records. For example, in this case, example I just gave, that say the county attorney and the sheriff are having communications by email over the uh, 
event at the jail uh, where the inmate and the officer were in a fight when the inmate lost a tooth. Now, there may be information in that email that the inmate would love to have, but if it's communication between the county attorney and the sheriff, you know, as client uh, attorney, then it's, it's not disclosable uh, under CPLR 4503. So I put that in the checklist just so you can remember and remind you that it's there. The next one is documents are exempt from disclosure because they constitute attorney work product. And, you know, that's the attorney's notes. Uh, that's uh, the attorney uh, recommendations. Uh, that's the attorney's advice. So that is not uh, foilable because it uh, is exempt under the CPLR. So it puts it on the checklist uh, to remind you of that fact. Documents are exempt from disclosure by state or federal statute. Now, this is very important. Under, our, under 50A as it existed previously, this is the box you would check. You would have checked that in this new inmate foil because he had his tooth lost, you would check that the documents are exempt from disclosure by state or federal statute. The statute you would have cited is 50A. And so now that has changed. You won't be citing 50A. So uh, you now will be making a decision as to whether or not uh, uh, there is a state or federal statute that does prohibit the request. There you simply kind of have to know and understand and appreciate uh, you know, the universe of what uh, conduct, uh, what information is uh, confidential. Some of that is, uh, uh, you know, tax returns, uh, whether or not one is on uh, social services. Uh, there are specific state and federal laws that re prohibit the release of certain information. So I don't list all of that on this checklist, uh, but that's something that this reminds you to be thinking about what those federal or state uh, prohibitions on uh, release information are. Uh, so in this case, you know, I don't think you can say there is any state or federal uh, prohibition against releasing the information. Now the next item is important because this, the, the check number here is disclosure would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal property, personal privacy. So this is where you're getting into some of the more specific FOIL exemptions. So you have to understand what an invasion of personal privacy is. And the FOIL statute does give you guidance. And what I'm gonna just read, I don't have it on the slideshow, what I'm just gonna quickly read through are what those exemptions are and what are constituted by the statute to be an invasion of personal pro uh, privacy. Uh, but it's not exclusive, as the statute says. It's, you know, employment, medical, or credit histories. It's medical or personal records of the individual as a patient, but not related to uh, evidence in the case before one. It's the sale or release of lists of names and addresses. If such lists would be used for solicitation. It's disclosure of information of a personal nature when disclosure would result in economic hardship to the subject party and such information is not relevant to the work of the agency requesting or maintaining it. So no doubt that some information might have an economic or personal hardship, but if it's relevant to the disclosure request and to the person's uh, employment and job and public responsibilities, then it may well be disclosable. A disclosure information of a nature reported in confidence to an agency uh, and is not relevant to the ordinary work of such agency doesn't have to be disclosed. The important thing is there's a narrow list of exceptions in the statute. When you look at uh, the provision on the checklist that says disclosure would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal property in the citation 87.2b, 87.2b then refers you to the list of exceptions. But beyond that list of exceptions, it's really a judgment call. You have to make a decision whether or not the information requested is relevant to the job responsibilities of the parties whose records are, are being requested. Also, uh, you need to uh, decide whether or not uh, 
the records relate to an ongoing investigation. For example, if in this case of the prisoner and the correction officer, if the investigation of what happened is still going on, when the inmate made his FOIA request, you don't have to release that information relating to that investigation. Uh, it would be an invasion of personal privacy because the finding may be that the correction officer did nothing wrong, uh, that there was no evidence of anything done wrong. So until that uh, investigation is completed, there is not a finding. So the request for information is untimely relating to that. Now, if there were old records relating to misconduct, then one would need to release that. At least it wouldn't fall under that exception. Next slide, please. Uh, then the, some other items on the checklist, and these, this checklist includes all the exceptions under FOIL. Uh, the records requested are trade secrets. You know, that's not relevant here. Uh, you can read that later. Now, the next one, that records are compiled for law enforcement purposes and which, if disclosed, here it says would interfere with law enforcement investigation or judicial proceedings, deprive a person of a right to a fair trial, identify a confidential source, or reveal criminal investigative techniques. Now, this is really focused on true law enforcement uh, in investigations, you know, of a crime. Now, it may be that the inmate's behavior is being viewed as a crime, what he did within the walls of the prison. So if there is a criminal investigation being conducted, then this would be a reason uh, to uh, deny access to the records so long as the investigation is still going on. Next item on the checklist is documents relate uh, to a request for law enforcement disciplinary records and is subject to mandatory redaction. This, of course, is the new criteria that uh, is now under FOIL. So as you're going through your checklist, this is a reminder that uh, if it is for law enforcement disciplinary records, like our example is, you've got to review the criteria for a, a mandatory redaction and then not include those items in uh, the response to the FOIL. Next slide, please. The next item, too, is, is the new language of FOIL and is now on the checklist. Documents relate to requests for law enforcement disciplinary records and is subject to discretionary redaction for technical infractions. And of course, all these items give the site that helps you go look at the law. And you should always go look back at the law as a reminder as to what the, what the language means. Uh, so you're going to decide whether it was just a technical infraction or not, and then check that box and uh, give your opinion on what on what that is, and then identify what should be redacted. So as you move the item up to the FOIL officer, the FOIL officer himself, you know, would cross out what he believes is the technical infraction if he wants to use that option and not release that information to the inmate uh, making the request. Next item, disclosure could endanger the life and safety of any person. So this has uh, been narrowly determined, meaning is it truly determining, uh, uh, is it truly endangering life and safety? And uh, that's why, you know, also the access to home address and uh, access of address of children, all that information would fall under this category as well, as well as under any specific example, uh, specific exception. So uh, there are cases on what this means, this could endanger, but it is an exception. And also information that relates to a third party, you know, witnesses to a case, you know, confidential witnesses that could be endangered if the world knew who they were or other inmates who knew uh, and told stories as to what happened, you know, at the uh, uh, event at the, at the jail. So you need to look at that and see if it's, it's relevant or not. And also, the next item on the checklist is records are intra-agency or intra-agency. And of course, this means uh, inter-agency, you know, between the health department dealing with the, uh, with the corrections office. That's inter-agency. Intra-agency means between members of the corrections department. You can look at it that way. So you need to look and see if uh, uh, information uh, qualifies as an exception under here. Now, you can accept statistical or factual tabulations of data and instructions to staff that affect the public, 
final agency policy or determinations, external audits, uh, you know, but not audits performed by the controller. But what it might mean is if the personnel office is working with the collection office, communicating back and forth on this inmate who's requesting these records, and it's it's not part, you know, and it, they're referring and making references to the case, uh, it could fall under uh, interagency or intra-agency materials. So you need to look at that exception as well. You know, it's always important to remember that because one exception doesn't apply, another exception may. And there are a lot of cases out there decided by the courts interpreting the meaning of all these and helping guide you as to whether or not you think the exception applies. You don't just have to go by the, the, the black and white language in front of you. And the next, the records are examination questions. You know, this doesn't apply. It's like, no kidding. You can't release the answers to questions before the test is given. Disclosure would jeopardize the capacity of a county department or agency or entity that has shared information with an agency to guarantee the security of its information. It gets to, you know, protecting your, your uh, electronic uh, uh, communication equipment. And then records are photographs, and it goes on, and that's not relevant. But those are all checklists uh, for you to use for any FOIL request and not just for this FOIL request. So when you're sent that, take a look at it and see if it's helpful to you at all to use uh, in your county uh, to uh, process uh, these FOIL requests. So that's, that's my summary here. I, I think it's just important to remember that you know this is a new world when it comes to access to this particular information. You need to treat it just like you treat any other request for FOIL, except there are some new provisions to FOIL that applies directly to requests for access you know, to law enforcement disciplinary records. So you apply all of it. And the checklist kind of lists the entire universe of, of what needs to be assessed when making that judgment, but FOIL governs here, and there is no 50A to fall back on. And uh, whenever getting a FOIL request, you know, just be responsive. You don't want to sit on it. They can pile up and use your common sense, because your common sense usually means there's an exception there somewhere, if that's what you're looking for, to, and to look for that. So that's my presentation, Steve. Anyone has any questions? And also, if anybody has any questions offline, you can always feel free to call me or uh, send me an email. Okay, uh, Marty Mack, Attorney Marty Mack, thank you so much. Uh, again, to contact Marty Mack, Marty Mack at MacWalshPLLC.com. You see it on the, the website there, uh, how to reach Marty, his telephone number, 607-236-5575. We're going to uh, put this webinar on our website, archive it, uh, put it up there this afternoon. We'll also have the uh, FOIL checklist, abbreviated version for you, and we will circulate that, post it on our website and have that available to those that need. Uh, Marty, we do have just a, a couple of questions sure. that have come in. If you have questions, please submit it in your question box right on your screen there. Uh, the first question I want to ask is, who does this apply to? And I, I can I could take a stab at that, Marty. Sure. Uh, uh, that who does this apply to? Because it, it is an extensive list of who this applies to, and it really applies to police officers that are designated in Section 1.20 of the Criminal Procedure Law. So who are they? Let's go through them quickly. A sworn member of the Division of the State Police. Okay, that's a state function. Sheriffs, under sheriffs, deputy sheriffs of counties outside of New York City. So this is a sheriff, Marty, this is an independent elected official that's specifically named uh, in yes. the list. Uh, sheriffs under sheriffs and deputy sheriffs. A sworn officer of an authorized county or county parkway police department. A sworn officer of an authorized police department or force of a city, town, or village or police district a sworn officer of an authorized police department of an authority, or a sworn officer of a state regional park police in the Office of Parks and Recreation, a sworn officer of the Capitol Police Force, an investigator, 
employed in the office of the district attorney. An investigator employed by the commission created by an interstate compact, that's not necessary here. The chief and deputy fire marshals, the supervising fire marshals, and the fire marshals of the Bureau of Fire Investigation of the New York City Fire Department. The sworn officer of police uh, force of a public authority created by an interstate compact, the Long Island Railroad Police, a special investigator employed as a statewide organized crime task force, a sworn officer of the Westchester County Department of Public Safety Services, who on or prior to June 13, 1999, was appointed as a sworn officer of the Division of Westchester County Parkway Police, or who was appointed uh, a police officer, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, or inspector for Westchester County Police. Uh, a sworn officer of the Water Supply Police, employed, employed by the City of New York. First is appointed, appointed as railroad police officers, employees of the taxation and uh, um, uh, the New York State Department of Tax and Finance, an employee of the Suffolk County Department of Parks, who as a Suffolk County Park Police Officer, a university, State University of New York police officer, a sworn officer of the Department of Public Safety by the Buffalo Municipal Housing Authority, persons appointed as Indian police officers, forest rangers, and that just about covers it. So it's a wide ranging uh, in group of individuals pursuant to 1.20 of the criminal procedure law. Marty, any other reaction to that? Uh, no, I think that's right. It's a very extensive list, and I think it was important for them to list it because there was some ambiguity under 50A, kind of had been expanded piecemeal and over time. So it's very clear now, one goes to the list, you're on it or you're not. Okay. Marty, next question is, uh, and you and I had talked about this before we got underway here today. Okay, so the statute is effective June 12, 2020, immediately in place. Is the cause and effect of this legislation retroactive? Does it apply to records on a go forward basis? I think the legislature missed it here and they should have put it in there. This may have to go to the courts. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, the thing is when my thought is that when they're looking at records and looking at the history, the history is the history and they're going to be looking back before the effective date. Uh, even as it relates, even though the request in, for requests that came in after the effective date. Uh, I, if, if, I think that will be the default, but I, I don't know. I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, the qu question is how, whether or not, has that issue, uh, maybe Steve, is, is that an issue? Do you know if anybody, any of the associations have addressed to see what their intent was or, their, or was there silence just to create some ambiguity? No, uh, but it's well, it's... It's, it's the first time hearing about it today because of this webinar. It's a very good question. You and I had talked about this beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, think I think we're going to have to look into this one and uh, I'll, we'll seek some because, commentary. Because otherwise, no. the, I, I don't think their intention was that, the, you know, that it's only a history subsequent to June 12th because uh, that history may well have been available under 50A, so the history doesn't change. So... Uh, well, what if you had... A situation, Marty, with something that was in process and records had been sought, let's just say, three years ago, and the case is still active, and the case is still active. Does that particular case from a prior year, three years ago, with this new statute on the books now, does that suddenly release the personnel records as public information? Well, again, looking at the, they're looking at the record for discipline, and that could be a record over 15 years, so there could be 20 items on it. If there's still an open investigation on the behavior, you know, that could be accepted. You know, we said that it's an invasion of personal privacy because there is no uh, conclusion yet. So it's not, there's not a determination. And releasing information and putting one in a bad light when there hasn't been such a determination, uh, I think would be uh, one that could be legitimately accepted. So, but if it's closed and it's a new request and that's part of the history, my guess it was the intent of the legislature to, in, to have that included. Okay, next we'll question. Uh, next question, Marty. Uh, 
I can't see this here. Now the bill, the law is specific on what shall be redacted. The law yeah. is also specific on what may uh, be redacted uh, and uh, uh, or considered to be redacted. So that this question is, uh, are the names of those making the review and the disposition decisions of the uh, of the police officer, firefighter, correction officer, uh, that into those individuals making the review and disposition decisions, are those are the names of those individuals subject to disclosure? Well, I think that you know if there's a de if there's a determination by uh, even even now, just say under the you know. Uh, if so, if there's a hearing officer and the hearing officer makes a determination or whoever makes the determination and they sign it and that document is accessible, the name will be there. Now, you won't have information, uh, you know, the, the name and the address uh, and telephone number of that individual who made the decision internally. Uh, you would want to redact that information uh, just under some of the other general provisions, but I don't. I don't think you would be able to redact the name uh, unless, you know, I don't see, think there's an anonymous decision. You would know who made that decision. Okay. Uh, you would have to, I mean, if there's issues that are particular to how it was made, whether it's a group, you know, those you'd have to look at, but I don't think you just, there, that when, when I request the disciplinary record and there's a, there's a determination by somebody and I want to see the record, I don't think you'd be redacting the name of the person that made the record, made the made the decision. Okay, just a couple more. We are approaching that hour in. Uh, a not-for-profit uh, is not subject to freedom of information law. However, they have peace em officers employed by them. Are they somehow now subject to this? Is the uh, you know the public officers law? must apply to apparently to uh, a state and local government, meaning a state of New York agency or a county, town, city, village. A not-for-profit is not subject to FOIL. However, they have peace officers employed by them. Are they now subject to this? No, for, I instance, those, yeah, for instance, yeah. the not-for-profit humane society and animal control officers are peace officers. So the question is now directed towards those individuals. Well, if they're, there's two kind of issues there. They are peace officers. Are they assigned off the clock? Or are they, or is it, is there part of their job responsibilities, you know, for the government? There's actually cases out there on that. And without uh, double checking the language of the case and see how nuanced it is, I just wouldn't want to give a quick answer. But it's, it's a good question. But there's kind of a, a line between where it's related and where it's not related and where one kind of loses one's identity as a, is a government official and where one does it. So I guess it depends on the on the relationship between the government, the peace officer, and the not-for-profit. Uh, but it's a, it's an issue to look at and explore. And uh, I, I know I've seen cases on that issue. Okay, but terrific. I, I, I don't feel comfortable giving a black and white answer. Okay, no problem at all. Um, let's, uh, there's a, one more question here. Um, we're, we're at that hour. Let's go to uh, technical violations. What is to be redacted? Oh, what you would redact there is like, it said Officer Smith is came into work on record? Tuesday. Yeah. No, no, you wouldn't redact. I don't think you read. Yeah, I would read because, I, let me, I guess I'll give it this way. Officer Smith came into work on Wednesday wearing gray pants when he's supposed to wear blue pants, you know, and he was given, you know, a warning. Red I'd redact the entire thing. It's it's just it's a technical violation, and uh, it's just not it's just not relevant. It's not related to his job duties. It's related to some obligations and of address, but it's not related to his performance. In a general sense, so I would just redact the whole provision. And to, again, some of this stuff is going to be tested. But what's the what's the sense of saying he was, you know, he was docked a day pay for a technical violation, uh, but you don't list what the violation is. You know that creates some problem as well. Just well, why was he punished? So I think that the intent here is to redact the entire uh, provisions relating to a violation of a technical that's defined as technical. Okay. Okay. We'll see so what the technical infraction. 
Yep, technical infraction means a minor rule infraction not involving the public interest. So as, public as defined, and the statute, the new FOIL law defines that term as we showed in the uh, uh, in the PowerPoint. So you just, and you're going to be defining it in many cases for the first time because there's no court cases yet. So you just use good faith and uh, ex uh, articulate your reason and have it in the record and you redact it. Okay, that will conclude today's webinar. Again, I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Nymere, the New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal, uh, providing uh, property casualty uh, law enforcement coverage for over 900 municipalities in the state of New York and 30 New York counties. Our speaker today has been Marty Mack, attorney at law. Thank you very much. We will be posting this website or this webinar on the Association of Counties website, www.nysac.org. Uh, Marty, thanks so much. Thank you, Stephen. You'll also be providing a checklist, right, Austin? And the checklist will be posted as well. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today.